here watching a Gospel Project Sunday School lesson from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas, and the Sunday School it starts at 9.30 a.m. every Sunday. Grab your Bible. Let's study together. We just want to uh, stop for a moment before you guys get into your lesson for your Explore the Bible or the Gospel Project just to say thank you for all the prayers. We appreciate that. We felt them all Yes. Uh, going through the COVID-19 stuff in, in this house. Um, we knew you were there and, and uh, praying for us and God is good. He's taking us through that. Um, yeah. I told the pastor that, you know, um, with the headaches and everything that I had, it was really hard to keep up with my reading schedule of the Bible, but my praying got a whole lot more. <laughs> so anyway, either way, God was encouraged me and Holy Spirit was working through us as we walked through uh, the virus and stuff. But guys, uh, we thank you for all the prayers. I just want to take a moment here to talk a little bit about Redbud. I mean, where we're headed, what we need to do, and how each one of you fit into that. So let me show you a slide real quick right here. And, and, you know, just talk about the mission of the church through scripture that, you know, our church has a going church, um, growing disciples, and that's fit right out of uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. The mission of the church is discipleship, which requires people to lead new life in Christ, you know, evangelize them. And each one of us need to be doing that. Each one of us need to be evangelizing those around us and then instruct them how you know, to reach their full potential in Christ, just like we do. So one, we need to be growing in Christ, and two, we need to be bringing others along to grow in Christ as well. And then we move on up to number two, and the, and the church purpose is to love God completely. And I remember Greg was talking about this a little bit before too. And if you look at Matthew 22, verses 33, 37 through 40, uh, where it's talking about you need to love God and then love your neighbor, but you got to love God so much that it's overflowing, that cup's overflowing full of love, God's love, that it actually flows over and pours into others around you. So that, that type of love of, of God needs to be happening in each one of us. So that's what we need to be doing there as well. And then if we look on to the next part of it, it's the structure of the church is a living organism. It, it grows. It must be nurtured. And that nurturing is it with love. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 15 through 16. Um Love is what's going to keep us together with each other. Love is what's going to keep us reaching out to others around us. And then number four here is um, on this slide, I'm talking about the dynamic design of church is relational and interactive, expressing itself independent, independent or interdependent. In other words, it, it, you know, there's a lot of individuals here, but we got to work together to make this happen. So it's interdependent ministry. By following the one another commands that we find out in Scripture, and also if you look in Romans 12, verses 4 through 8, and 1 Corinthians 12, um, 12 through 27, which is all on the slide right here, go back and read these things. But this is talking about you know each one of the each one of the parts coming together. Each one has a function, but together as a church we work together. And and you know the, the ear can't be the nose, the nose can't be the leg, the foot can't be the hand, so forth, so on. In fact, if we're missing parts of those because you're not a part of this, then we're not going to be functioning the way that we need to be functioning. So every one of you is a part of that, and we try to get you plugged in with your um, spiritual gifts as well. But that's not to say that you, you quit evangelizing and discipling people because that's each one of us need to be doing that as well. But when we come together in this uh, interdependent ministry together, which, which is red bud for us, we need to be working together with the spiritual groups, spiritual gifts that we have. So that was just kind of a brief uh, uh, church, um, you know, service message, you know, <laughs> brought to you by Red Bud Baptist Church. But guys, this is stuff I, that you need to be thinking about when we come back together. I know some of you guys are still at home, but actually we need to be working on this stuff while we're at home. And, you know, that way we're all focused when we come together. But that doesn't mean, you know, don't stop reaching people. Don't stop loving God to the point that it overflows, like Greg says. Don't stop, you know, being the part that you need to be a part of. You know, just like the pastor, Pastor Carlos tells us all the time, you know, we each fit together to grow this church. Church is not hard. Church is not, it's not hard to grow church. We make it so complicated. It is so simple. And that's just showing God's love to others around you and, and show them why you have that love and, and why Christ is working through you. 
it, we don't have to make it so complicated, guys, that, that we can't grow red bud. God's in control. He has this church in his hands. All we have to do is allow him to work through each one of us and do our part in reaching those around us and inviting them into church, of course. So we love you guys. I'm going to turn this over to the professionals. That's our teachers, and they're going to lead you in this uh, week's Sunday school lesson. So thank you, guys. L thank you again for all the prayers, and we're yes. feeling much, much, much better. better. And we got, we'll got. we see you guys up at Red Bud. Talk to you later. All right, good morning. This is uh, the Sunday morning lesson for the Gospel Project. This is Unit 26, uh, Session 2. We're on page 57. And this one is when uh, Jesus is being questioned by some of the Jewish leaders. Um, and I just want to point out that there was, we're going to find as we go through this, there's going to be some debate. This is going to be talk about resurrection. And the Pharisees believed in resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. And so Jesus is not only in a debate with the Jewish leaders collectively, but at several times, he kind of stands alone in his opinion and direction that he takes the idea of resurrection um, based upon some of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, so the Pharisees had it partially right. The Sadducees, Sadducees had it not at all right. And Jesus, so he's, he's sometimes he's in agreement with the Pharisees. Sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's making the Sadducees mad, as we see. And sometimes he's just making the Pharisees mad. Um, but before we actually start the lesson, let me... Um, Open us in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful and wonderful day. We pray, Father, as we go through this day, that we are always a shining light for your kingdom. I lift up those, Father, that today are suffering from physical ailments. Whatever pain they have, they may offer it up to you. I pray, Father, for those that are spiritually lost, that those of us that have the gift, the gift of salvation and the fact that we understand that your son died buried and was resurrected and rose again for us that we will share that gift with all those to whom we have an opportunity let us humbly father always remember that it is because you love us that we should love others and i pray these things father in your holy and blessed name amen all right we're actually in mark 12 uh, 13 through 40. And before I actually start, I'll say that again. Mark 12, 13 through 40. And before I actually start, I want to talk about witnesses and witnessing. Not in the sense of sharing the good news um, per se, but just the idea of witnessing. Because if you look on your quarterly on page 50, 57, it says, How might the story parallel some people's thoughts about Jesus? And this is the idea of him being in this debate with uh, several of the different types of Jewish leaders. Um, and I want to point out <clears throat> that being a witness, I, I wrote down on mine a court system, because in a court system we're supposed to have two or more credible witnesses before we can be found guilty of, of something. I mean, we'll see in this, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and I'll say them twice for you. Genesis 31, 52. Genesis 31, 52, Matthew 18, 15 through 17, that's Matthew 18, 15 through 17, and then Revelations 11 and 3, Revelations 11 and 3, and it's really important that we understand this idea of having witnesses, and you're going to see this at, towards the end of this lesson, the power of witnesses, um, and then it's going to move itself from what we would think of as a court witness into us being witnesses. Um, so I'm going to read Matthew 18, 15 through 17 first. It says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along. So that every mass, every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So there's the scriptural basis, two or three witnesses. And keep that in mind because we're going to see it again at the end. And then it finishes off by, in 17 by saying, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. So meaning the entire body of Christ. Um, if 
you go back to Genesis, this is not a novel concept. Genesis, it says, Genesis 31, 52, it says, this heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness. So there again is the concept of two witnesses, the heap and the pillar. And I've kind of taken it out of context. So if you really want to dive into it, you'll have to go back to Genesis 31 and read the entire chapter. But again, the concept of two or three. And then in Revelations 11.3, it says, I will appoint my two witnesses. And so the reason that this, that this is all important and the reason I've hovered over this for a little bit is that we know in the Middle East, during the time of Jesus, this Hellenistic culture, that's the blending of the Greeks with local cultures. In the Greco-Roman world, the body was viewed as something that was evil and it was supposed to be discarded whatever their religious beliefs were in the, in that, in that Greco-Roman or the Hellenistic era of time, it's the body is something that's evil. And resurrection is not a concept that's uh, in the minds of Greeks or Romans. All right. Here's point one. It says, Jesus teaches the reality of resurrection from God's word. This is Mark 12, 19 through 27. Mark 12, 19 through 27. And actually, before I read the actual scripture out of Mark, I just want to want us to focus on the word resurrection for a minute. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to be really bold and say this, and this is not just me. I saw this in a lot of commentaries and dictionaries and things as I was preparing for this lesson. But if you stop and think about all the doctrine, the dogma, the things, the beliefs that Christianity hinges on, the thing it hinges on the most, and we learn this in the writings of Paul, the thing it hinges on the most is the idea of the resurrection. This is the central document for Christian theology. It is through this document of the resurrection that Christianity provides its message of eternal life, and the fact that that eternal life is secure. Without this as our linchpin, Christ, the Christian message is simply reduced to one of man's philosophies, causing uncertainty amongst believers and jeopardizing all of Christianity. Put simply, without the resurrection, there is no church. Without the resurrection, there is no New Testament. Without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith. And so with that, keep that in mind as we go through this. And that's why this is so important for us to grasp. And I've prayed all week long because there's some tricky spots here. And I've prayed personally that I do justice to them. <clears throat> so I'm going to do things a little different, but um, I'm going to read certain sections, but I just want you to keep in mind here one more thing before I get into this reading the scripture, is that there are really three approaches to the resurrection, and this is not Greg Reinhardt, these came out of commentary. Um, the first one is the nature of why we shouldn't believe is because the eyewitnesses' experiences cannot be found out to be certain. So again, the idea, and this is why I focused on witnesses here at the beginning, is the idea that, well, the eyewitnesses said these things happened, but we have no other corroborating evidence, and so that it can't be found out to be certain. That's the first approach, that the original eyewitnesses maybe were, and I've heard things, and this is not in the commentary, I've actually heard that it's possibility that they were maybe hallucinating, and I'll come back to that towards the end and, and address that. But that's the idea of the first approach. The second approach is that we only know the resurrection by faith because there's nothing that can verify it. So it's only through faith that somebody should believe in the resurrection and there's no corroborating evidence. So they've even taken out the fact of the eyewitnesses, that the eyewitnesses don't even have any say so in this, that it's just strictly a faith-based thing, and you can believe it or not believe it, take it or leave it. Here's the third approach. The resurrection itself 
is an event concerned with death, judgment, and final destiny of the soul, or in theological terms, estacology, or estacolo, it's this is estacological. Um, however, those things, death, judgment, and the final destination of the soul, cannot be de demonstrable by historical, methodological methods, but may be verified in the future. So again, they're still hinging on the idea that we cannot believe in the resurrection because we have no evidence. The only way it's going to be verifiable is, it, and I'm going to add this here, it said in the future, meaning when Christ returns, then we're going to realize, oh darn, it was really true. And here's the final one, and this is the one that most of us should be in. There is available historical evidence which demonstrates the probability that Jesus was literally raised from the dead. We read it in Scripture. We're going to read it here in Mark when Jesus discusses it, and Paul and others talk about it after it occurs. But years ago when I was a young 20-something guy and I was struggling with my faith, because if, if I haven't said it and you haven't watched me before, I grew up Roman Catholic. And so it wasn't that I was not a churchgoer, but I was a Catholic churchgoer, and I was struggling with ideas that the church told me and things that I was reading in Scripture. And so in the, when I was in the Marine Corps, I went to a chaplain who happened to be Presbyterian, and he led me through some Bible Scriptures, and we talked about things in very open and candid discussions. Um, but this is what I remember from our discussions. <clears throat> If you think about the tomb story, when Jesus is buried in the tomb, there's only one plausible explanation, and it is the resurrection. Because the Romans did everything possible to guard the tomb. The Jewish leaders did everything possible to guard the tomb. Because what we're going to read today is, in Mark, Jesus is talking about being raised, and there's other times where he's more explicit about he's going to die, be buried, and be resurrected. They did everything possible to keep that from happening. And if it didn't happen, and this is where you have to give me a little leeway here, if it didn't happen and, and the soldiers weren't there, or the Pharisee, the Jewish leaders didn't have the guards on the tomb, their thinking was that the, Jesus' disciples were going to come to the tomb in the middle of the night and steal the body so that they could say that he did resurrect. That makes sense, the way I said that. They were trying to prevent the disciples from stealing the dead body and to make it be that Jesus was resurrected. Now we know in Scripture, and you're going to see here with eyewitnesses, that that didn't take place. They did put guards on it. Nobody stole the body. They reported it that way through eyewitnesses. And in that event, the only plausible explanation is that the angel came, rolled the stone away, sat on it, and waited for Mary because Jesus had been resurrected. That is the only plausible explanation. So the, of the four approaches, the only one to believe is the historical evidence of the eyewitnesses. So here's the scripture. It says, Mark 12, 19 through 27. Teacher, which is rabbi, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife behind but no child, that man should take the wife and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first married a woman and dying left no offspring. The second also took her and he died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And none of the seven left offspring. Last of all, the woman died too. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be since the seven had married her? So I'm going to argue these have to be Pharisaic uh, believers, Pharisees, be because they actually believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees would not have posed the question that way because they did not believe in the resurrection. And so now think through the, through our approaches. Um, and let me just read something to you. I'm going to read about the resurrection out of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. For what I received, 
I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is Arabic for Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And all the apostles, I don't have a number. I couldn't find a number for all the apostles. But just the fact that he appeared to Peter, then the 12, and then 500. And they're going back to the idea of having a hallucination. Over the years, I've done a little bit of reading about this, and I'm, there's no conclusion that 500 people can hallucinate about the same event in the same manner at the same time. So that discards the idea that there was some hallucinating property or spell, or they all took some drug, and that because of that, that's they hallucinated the resurrection of Jesus, that he had appeared to them. I'm going to be the devil's advocate here and say, possible if it was only Peter. One person could do that. Twelve people can't do that. And definitely 500. And then James. And then we don't know how many, it says, oh, <coughs> all the apostles. Maybe that's another 500. Maybe that's 2,000. I don't have a number. But it just it's not possible for 500 people, when you do some psychological research, for 500 people to hallucinate at the same time on the same event. So it must have been a real event. Again, the only plausible explanation for Jesus not being in the tomb is the fact that the angel came, rolled the stone away, and Jesus was resurrected. Here's the remaining part of the scripture. Verse 24. Jesus spoke to them. Isn't this the reason why you're mistaken? You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. So in this point right here, Jesus is challenging them on two points. So he, Jesus is using two witnesses against them. Even before we get to the, the re real resurrection in Corinthians, which I just read, this is Jesus talking about the possibility and that he would be resurrected. So he's talking about the resurrection. And remember the idea of two or three witnesses. So Jesus gives them two witnesses right here. And, and they're not people. But one, they don't know scripture enough to understand. And I'll give you some background on that in just a second. And two, they obviously have not experienced the power of God personally to know that God can do whatever he desires. And in this case, it is the resurrection. And Jesus is pointing that out to these Jewish leaders. And so if we look at Old Testament and the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders should have known these things. I'm going to give you about five or six verses here. And I'll, again, I'll say them twice. It's 1 Samuel 28, 8 and 9. It's 1 Samuel 28, 8 and 9. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men, there's the witness, went to a woman. Con and this is what he asked. He said, consult a spirit for me. He said, and bring up for me the one I name. So Saul's going to this oracle, if you will, using a Greek term. And asking that person, I'm going to give you a name and you draw this person out of death. So that I can see their spirit and talk to them. So there is a notion that the re that resurrection or speaking to people who had died, it, it is a possibility. Job 10, 20 and through 22. Job 10, 20 and through 22. Are not my days few almost over? Turn away from me so I have a moment's joy. Before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and utter darkness. That's a very Sumerian uh, concept of the dead, gloom and darkness. Isaiah 38, 18. 
Isaiah 38, 18. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for faithfulness. Faithfulness. So you see in these last two, there is a notion that there's something going on, that it's just not a body that gives itself up to the dirt and returns to, as Christians would say, we would argue that we came from dust, we're going back to dust. There is something else going on there because if Saul can ask for a spirit to come out of wherever he's talking to, or we can go down to the pit and there's no praise, it's dark and gloomy. Job and Isaiah kind of put them together. Psalms 30, verse 9. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Again, it's not giving the idea that the spirit's dead, just the body. Psalm 6, 5. Psalm 6, 5. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? And here's the last one. Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 139, 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. Sounds pretty Christian, correct? The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. The body's not going to just die. There's something else going on here because it says the Lord endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hand. So the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, I keep saying Pharisees because I know they, they're the ones that believe in the resurrection. A little different than what Jesus preaches. Um, but your, the quarterly talks about just uh, Jewish leaders. So they know. You just go back and read Psalm 139, 7 and 8. And what do we see there is that the Lord's going to remove the curse of death. And we know that in the scripture that Christ dies for us and all of humanity to remove the pain, the darkness, the utter darkness, the gloominess, the no praising, the faithful faithfulness list, the hope, hopelessness of going down into a pit. All of that's removed with the resurrection of Christ. Now let's go on. For when they raise from the dead, they never marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, haven't you read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush? How does God talk to Moses? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Verse 27 says, this is Jesus now talking to the Jewish leaders. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then he chastised them and he finishes off the reading. It says, you are badly mistaken. So we learn in this scripture in verse 25 that we're rescued from the pains of death because of the resurrection of Christ. And when it says in verse 25, they never marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And we know that because we speak of that all the time. Our purpose in heaven and in earth is solely for one thing. And that is to serve God. And Jesus is pointing that out to him. Going back to verse 24. Isn't this the reason why you're mistaken? Talking about each brother taking the other as long as there's no children. Taking the same woman. You don't know scripture. And I read you six Old Testament verses. Where they should have known scripture a little better. Or the power of the personal experience of God. Again, pointing back to 
Moses. And I would argue that we could talk about in the wilderness. How many times does, does God do something on behalf of those lost in the wilderness? In the books of Moses or in our lives? How many times does he do something and we think that it's only because of us? Water, manna, quail. That was in the wilderness. But what has God done for you? How has he protected you? How has he redirected you? How has he guided you? He does those things for all of us. And we're going to see in the next verse why. The key here is to remember this. We are assured, and Jesus tells us this, we are assured of our future life for salvation or for resurrection. And what it's through is our relationship with God through our covenant of faithfulness. Our covenant of faithfulness. Remembering that Christ died for us, buried for us, and was resurrected for us and ascended into heaven for us to sit at the right hand of the Father. And he interdicts and intercedes for us on multiple occasions, and oftentimes, like those that lost in the wilderness, we simply grumble about how bad our life is, and we forget about the blessings that Christ gives us every single day. Here's point two. Jesus teaches the primacy of love from God's word. This is Mark 12, 28 through 34. <coughs> Mark 12, 28 through 34. And before I read them, I just want you to keep this in mind because with the Jews, it can be argued, with the, even with the Jewish leaders, maybe probably more so, they believed in division. And this is what I mean by that. A lot of times we talk about the Ten Commandments. But when you read the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative. Negative meaning thou shalt not. Go look at the Ten Commandments. Take those ten as a sample. And I believe eight of the ten are negative. So only two of them are positive. And I want to say it's three and four. Have no other gods before you. Worship the Sabbath. Honor your mother and father. The rest of them say, thou shalt not. That's a negative. And so out of the 613 commandments, they have cataloged them as six, I'm sorry, 365 negative commandments. That's 365 negative commandments and 248 positive commandments. And you can see this division, things to do and things not to do. Now we're going to complicate it a little more with this idea of division because they further divide these into the heavy commandments and the light commandments. And the easiest way to think about that is the heavy commandments are the ones that are the most important. The light commandments are the ones that are less important. And I would argue that if God said it, there's no categorizing. Oftentimes we do that. We like to categorize things. And we'll hear in, we'll hear in Christian circles, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but we're, a lot of times we'll, we'll do the same thing. We usually do it this way. Not in a commandment. We usually do it this way. Yes, I know I sin, but my sin is not as bad as his. That's division. For God, there is no category of sin or sinfulness. Either you're sinning or you're not. There's no grades of sin. You're either with God or you're against God. Even in John 3, 16, if you read the verses before or after, it says, for those who believe. So those who not believe... There's two categories. All right. And here's the, here's the scripture. Again, it's Mark 12, 28 through 34. One of the scribes approached. When he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, what command is the most important of all? Now, let me just stop there for a second and tell you, the scribes in, in ancient times, the scribes were the ones who did the writing of the law. 
So we would think of them today as lawyers. And so they were very gifted in write, reading, writing, and reasoning because they were writing the law and, and supposed to understand the law. Probably even better than what we would call the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were the actual writers of what the law was. And so he's complimenting Jesus. And I read somewhere preparing for the lesson that this is the only positive interchange between Ju uh, Jesus and scribes or Jesus and the Jewish leaders. Because you can see it's kind of amicable. It's very friendly in their approach back and forth. He doesn't condemn Jesus. Jesus doesn't condemn him. It's just, very, it's just a very friendly approach. Here's the rest of it. So the, answer, the question was, what command is the most important of all? And then 29, Jesus answers. The most important is listen, Israel. Whenever it says listen, or truly, or heed, it goes back to Jesus telling the parable that there are some of us who hear and some of us who listen. And so that in itself is kind of a slap in the face because you're hearing me, but you're not listening to me. As many times as Jesus says that, or truly, take heed. You've been hearing me, but are you really listening? <clears throat> the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. <coughs> so, Stop for a minute, and that's why I started off with the idea of division. What does it say in verse 29 at the end? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Just on that statement alone, Jesus is professing the idea of being a monotheist, that there is only one God in the entire universe. And that's a novel concept because the Greco-Romans taught polytheism, multiple gods. We have a God for this, a God for that, and a God for this, and a deity for that, and a deity for that. We Christians only have one God, and he is not divisible. Godhead, three beings in the Godhead. That's one. And in that, jump ahead here, what does it say at the end? In 31, it says, the second commandment is, love your neighbor. So verse 30 says, love the Lord. And verse 31 says, love your neighbor. So if we profess to be followers of Christ, believers in the God Almighty, and God is one, just like sin is not sliceable into different categories, Love is not sliceable into different categories. We go back to the idea that we love God, therefore, because of, then we love others. I know a lot of times we think, think about love your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus is telling them, because we all seem to love ourselves, and that's not a narcissistic um, self-indulgence of love, a personal love. But that's saying that if you love yourself this much, then why aren't you loving God as much? We have a tendency, even today, many of us, even in Christ Christianity, have a tendency to say, well, I love God, I love me, and we get in this direction, don't we? I'm a little more important than God. I love God more. That's the struggle Adam and Eve had in the garden. They believed the serpent and took the fruit and ate of it, even though God told them no. So they placed themselves above God. And all of our sins can really be penned in one title, idolatry. When we, we wore something other than God first, it is idolatry. And Jesus is challenging this notion back to the days of Adam and Eve that it's idolatry. When Adam and Eve took the fruit and ate of it, they were more important than God. And that's our struggle through the eternal flesh in our fleshly world is to keep, make God back more important than the flesh. And so I want to focus again on this notion of no separation of love and we can't separate sin 
And we can't, we can't tell ourselves that we love God and not love everybody else. I know some people are hard to like sometimes. They're difficult people. But there still means that we are supposed to love them. If we claim we love God, then we should love all of his creation and all of his children. There's no separating. And you'll see that. What does he say? What does Jesus answer? The most important is listen, Israel. Take heed. Do something more than hear me. The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. All. That doesn't say take a piece and save it for myself. That doesn't say take a piece and save it for somebody else. If I truly say that I love God, then it's everything I am. My mind, my strength, my heart, my soul. It's everything. And Jesus is going to come back to that concept here towards the end of this. But there's no way to separate the two. We cannot argue as Christians that we're made in the image of God and then be ungodly. We can't be godly and fleshly at the same time. We can't be spiritual and fleshly at the same time. We're either godly or we're fleshly. And we've done the separation. God is not separated from us. We have separated from him. Adam and Eve separated from God. God did not separate from them. And Jesus challenges that notion going back to what it said in verse 24. Isn't this the reason why you're mistaken? You don't know the scripture and you don't know the power of God. There's been no personal experience in your life. I would argue for Christians, our marker, like Joshua's 12 stones when they crossed the Jordan, our marker is the baptismal. When we raise ourselves, we're raised up out of that. and we're, we're granted this eternal gift of salvation through the resurrection of Christ. And we should always be joyful of that and always mindful of that and always sharing that with other individuals. Here's verse 32. Then the scribe said to Jesus, You are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one. He being God, and there is no one else except him. The idolatry, who's above who? Where do we place ourselves? Verse 33, and to love him with all our heart, with all our understanding, and with all our strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. So the scribe has come back to Jesus' notion. And let me just tell you that when you read this in Matthew 29 through 31, it's also found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8, 9, 10, wherever you want to stop. I put 4 through 7 for today because it matches up closer to what we read today. For the Jews, that's called the Shema. That is a very holy prayer that they pray daily in the morning as part of their prayer rituals, the Shema. And what it is is, is a proclamation of my heart to say that God is number one in my life because he's number one in my head, he's number one in my heart, he's number one in my soul, he's number one in my hands, and as the scribe said, he's number one in my understanding. Nothing comes before God. <coughs> but even the Jews practiced separation. And you see it in the, in the last part of that verse there. It is far more important than all the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. There's multiple ways that the Jews made offerings and sacrifices to God at the temple or on the altar and before the temple in the tabernacle. It is a separation. When you have a burnt offering to God, it means it's burned till it disappears. A sacrifice is something that is partial. It was allowed for the, the priests and the Levites, the Jewish leaders, to take a portion. So we sacrifice a bull. We can take a portion of that for ourselves. We sacrifice a goat. We can take a portion. So we're not giving all of that sacrifice to God. 
But a burnt offering is complete and totally. And so the scribe is, is even telling Jesus, I totally agree with you. And we practice it wrong, even in the sense that the burnt offerings and sacrifices are different. And you'll see this. I'm going to give you a, a prophet here. O, Hosea 6.6. 6. Hosea 6.6. 6. Hosea 6.6. 6. And this is God talking to the prophet. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. The idea of oneness. Mercy. I'm going to argue that that's love. When you love somebody, you show them mercy and kindness. I, that we're coming to the end of week number eight tomorrow at the school year for my school. Next week is week nine. And I have done my best to show grace and mercy to the students as we try to go through this weird COVID world of teaching because I would like that from my principal and the other people because I'm not technologically savvy. And I know it's not the same as saving a soul. But I've tried to give grace and mercy. And that's what the prophet is telling us in 6.6, 6, Hosea 6.6. 6, mercy, not sacrifice. Acknowledge God as one. Jesus and the scribe both said it. As one rather than a burnt offering. Give yourself totally. Not make a sacrifice through this burnt offering and say, well, I did my, did my part. I'm done with it. Several years ago when I taught in South Texas down in the valley, I had a boy who was a professed atheist. And one of the comments he made has just stuck with me. And he was challenging other students in my class. This was a senior government, senior level government class in high school. It was a private military school. And he said to the one boy who was challenging him about being a believer, he said, the atheist boy did, he said, Christians like to take the easy way out. They don't want to get their hands dirty. They just want to write a check and say, I did my part. And I'm not telling you not to tie the write a check for ministries or, or, or uh, organizations that you believe in. What I'm telling you is that it's even deeper than that. That's a great start. But in that has to be your love for God and your love for following Christ and your love because of those two empowered by the Holy Spirit, that your hands, mind, and feet do the work of God and that we offer ourselves completely and totally. And that's what this point here, Jesus teaches the primacy of love about God's word. Because if we truly love somebody, we're going to give our all to them. Those of you that have kids, go back and think about when you were first had your first baby. What were you willing to sacrifice for that child? And I can't give you a number, but I'm going to say magnify it infinity. And that's how much God loves us and Christ loves us because that's what he did when he went to the cross. That's what he did when he was buried. That's what he did when the stone was rolled away and he was resurrected. That's what he did when he sits at the right hand of the Father for us. There's no separation. I love you a little bit. There's no possibility of loving you. I love you or I don't love you. That's the switch. Point three. Jesus teaches the deity of the Messiah from God's word. And this is Mark 12, 35 through 37. Mark 12, 35 through 37. I got to have a drink. Excuse me. <coughs> and you're going to have to bear with me this one because in a lot of the commentaries I was reading about this, this is, a, this is a, an Aramaic Jewish riddle. And I've prayed all week that I get this right in my explanation. And in the quarterly, it talks about Psalm 110. And I'm going to let you just read that. And I'm going to reference a different one um, as we go through this. But the thing I want to mention before we get into this, the deity of the Messiah from God's word, and we read Mark 12, is that it's well established that the Messiah is going to come from the house of David, from the lineage of David. It's believed in Jewish times, it's believed in Christianity, that the Messiah is going to come from the house of David. Okay, that's firmly rooted. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, anybody who is a Jewish believer, Christian believers should be believing the exact same thing. The Messiah is going to come from the house of David, from David's lineage. 
Okay. And here's the here's the here's the verse. It is Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end forever. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So there's no debating. The Messiah is coming from David. In this riddle here, and in verse 35, it says, While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? And sometimes that's translated not son, like you'd think father and son, but descendant. It depends on how it's used. Sometimes it's translated as descendant. And then he goes on and says, David himself says by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. And so first, just remember, son can also mean descendant. But Jesus challenges them in this riddle that how can, we know the Messiah is coming from David, so how can David call the Messiah Lord? And the reason that's significant is because fathers never refer to their children, their male son, children or sons, as Lord. It was the child referring to the elder as Lord. So David, in this sense, is referring to the Messiah as his Lord. And you'll see that in the, towards the end of that verse 36. It says, David himself says by the Holy Spirit, the Lord declared to my Lord. So I took some liberty. And if you think about, let me give you the definitions here. It says, the Lord declared to my Lord. The first Lord in the Hebrew is always, the way it's written, is always referred to as Yahweh. So that's a name of, that's a name of God, Yahweh. The second Lord is Adonai. Sometimes that means God, and sometimes it does not. It just means Lord. So it's either God or Lord. So I took some liberty here, and it says, God said to my superior. So this is Jesus talking about David. God said to my superior. So Yahweh, the Lord declares to my Lord. Yahweh declared to my Adonai. Yahweh declared to my superior. God declared to my superior. And so if you look at that, in verse 37, it says, the, and I said this already, but the father never refers to his son as my Lord. That would be very dishonorable. So in all of this, the thing, and I'm going to read this because it, I struggled with the riddle. It, it, here's the issue. The issue is not whether Jesus is the descendant or son of David, but what it means for Jesus to be the son of David. Not whether he is the son of David, but what it means for Jesus to be the son of David. As David's Lord, Jesus captures the mystery of incarnation, acknowledging Jesus is Messiah and son of David but also recognizing these as inadequate, being limited simply by Davidic categories. Jesus is more than David's son. He is the son of man. And for us, that means that he's our representative for all of humanity. In that, it means that the son of man must suffer and be exalted at God's right hand as the Son of God. 
And the final thing here, the final point is, and the crowd was listening to him, Jesus, with delight. And so Jesus, to put it in our, our vernacular, the crowd was delighted, but he put, the, he put the scribes and Jewish leaders to shame because he explained logically through this Jewish riddle how he, can be the, how he could be David's descendant, but also David's Lord because he is not only the son of David, but he is the son of God. And therefore, that's David's Lord. And that goes back to God say, or Yahweh declared to my Lord, Adonai. And I pray that that makes sense because it really struggled with point three. If you see me in church and need more clarification, please come and ask me and I'll do my best to unmuddle what I may have muddled a little bit. But this is a Jewish riddle. It's, it's like when you translate something from another language in this case, Arabic or Hebrew, it loses something. I have a lot of friends that tell me, try to tell me jokes in Spanish. And when it translates, some, when it translates, it grossly loses its humor or its meaning, stated purpose. That's what this is for us. We know that David is the father in a long lineage that leads to Jesus. He is an heir. But Jesus came before David, and David refers to Jesus, or the Messiah, as his Lord. And so Jesus challenges the, the Jewish leaders on how can that be? How can he be both? And what it is, is they've, <coughs> they've been stuck in this idea, and it may explain why they struggled with the idea of the resurrection, the Messiah being who Jesus said he was, and they were simply looking for another militaristic savior like the Maccabees when they broke away from some of the Greek uh, leaders in the Hellenistic era. So that, that's the notion here, is that Jesus came before David, but David is his, if you will, biological father, but not his spiritual father. And through that, broadening of the categories of who Jesus is, then we can understand that Jesus is the Son of God. He had to suffer for us. He had to witness for us. He had his ministry. He died for us. He was resurrected, sits at the right hand of the Father. And again, if you'll go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 7, remember this is after the resurrection, but this is the proof through the witnessing. He first appeared to Peter or Cephas. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to 500. He appeared to James. And he appeared to the apostles. And what's key in all of that is he appeared to them while they were living. Because it says in verse 6, when he appeared to the 500, of the brothers and sisters at that time, most of whom are still living. So if somebody would have said something or added a fact or deleted a fact about the resurrection and Jesus appearing to them, it would have been found out. Think about it today, and then I'm going to close. If we were in a trial for murder and 500 people went up there and told the story about how you killed somebody, would you be convicted? And I'm going to argue most certainly. The facts may change. The light bulb may have been swinging. It may have been a big knife, a little knife, a hatchet, based on where they were standing. But the meat of the story does not change. Jesus appeared and is resurrected. It is the linchpin of Christianity. We must find a way to defend it through truth and love to help others come to the gift that God has granted us when we came out of the baptismal and share it with everyone we come in contact with. Let me close this in prayer. I thank you, Father, for allowing us to approach your word in humility and love. Thank you for the grace you offer us every day, Father, and the things that you do for us. And oftentimes we neglect to honor you by saying thank you. 
We pray, Father, for this nation as we come upon a very important election, that you will provide wisdom and knowledge to individuals who are going to vote. We pray, Father, that this nation will return back to its bedrock of Christianity. Oftentimes we cower from the challenges of the flesh, from the science, from the history. But it has been proven, Father, through Scripture, historically, scientifically, that you have been raised from the dead. And there will come a day, Father, when we will all sit in judgment and we will be judged by you for the deeds that we've done and those that we have not done. We pray, Father, that in that you always guide us so that we may be judged fairly for what we have done and the love that we've shown to your children and your creation. I pray these things, Father, in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.